want to talk to you tonight about the most powerful tool that God has given us to experience him, which is prayer. God speaks through the Bible. We talked about that last week. This is his words to us. And one of the means of communication he's given us is prayer. So if you take your notes tonight, God speaks through prayer. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Luke chapter 11, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Are you there? If you're not, there's a Bible behind me. It's pretty big. It's good for any eyes. Uh, if you can't see that, come to the altar. We might have to lay hands on your eyes. See what Jesus can do. I don't know. Luke 11 says this. Once Jesus was in a certain place praying. As he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John thought his disciples. He's talking about John the Baptist. Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need and forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. Can you say amen? amen. Couldn't get more simpler than that. I think sometimes we complicate prayer. But I think Jesus was trying to simplify it for them and simplify it for us. That it's just about communicating with a God who is already there and is for you. Can you say amen? amen? Now, what's interesting is that the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. Now, why is this interesting? Because prayer was not new. Prayer has always been part of their lives. Right? If you, if you, if you study humanity, humanity has always prayed to something. We always felt like we need some kind of help from some kind of source, right? And in the Jewish tradition, they always prayed to God, right? From the beginning, they always had a connection with God. And so why would his disciples who were used to praying ask Jesus to teach them how to pray, right? That's the question that I would have when I read the scriptures. It's like, why would someone who was used to praying say, teach me how to pray, right? And of course... What we've been talking about the few weeks is that the answer is that Jesus had a real encounter with God the Father. And it was so real that his prayer life looked a little bit different than the norm. And so they could recognize, wait a minute, we pray, but you pray different. <laughs> you know, we want to pray like that. Right? In other words, they saw in Jesus a prayer life that was actually fruitful. Because prayer, a lot of times in people's heart and minds, is just a mechanical, religious thing I got to get through. You know, some people don't have the experience in prayer. They just have the practice of prayer. There's a difference between the practice of prayer and the experience of prayer. Right? Like some people play basketball well on NBA 2K. But some people can't play basketball in real time, in real life. Right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like some people are experts in video games. But some people are experts in real life. And so there's a difference there between the mechanics of prayer and the experience of prayer. Are, are, you, are you tracking so far? Right? So, so to experience God through prayer is not just a religious activity. It's not just I got to say these things. And believe that somehow they made a difference. If you're taking notes tonight, prayer is a relationship interaction between two living beings. Prayer is a relationship interaction between two living beings. Like, I'm a living being, so is God. Right? So I'm not talking to some, you know, non-living person out there. Hoping and wishing that is making a difference. I'm not scratching a ticket and hoping to win. It's a two-way communication. 
right? It's a living God that I'm speaking to. And he's a living God that speaks back to me if I'm praying the right way. Are you following? So, so, so if you're taking notes tonight, prayer is actually one of the greatest indicators of your relationship with God. Let me say that again. Pray is one of the best indications of how healthy your relationship is with the Lord. Because in any given relationship, communication is the most key thing. Show me a couple who communicates, I'll show you a couple that's going to make it. Show me a couple who doesn't communicate, I'll show you a couple that's in trouble. Right? Because communication is the most key thing to any healthy relationship that you will ever have. And I mean on any level, not just couples, but I mean like between a boss and an employee, between kids and their parents, like any given relationship that's healthy, it's a two-way street. It can't just be one way. Right? Usually if it's one way, sooner or later, something is going to happen and hinder that relationship. Right? Any healthy relationship needs communication. Communication is essential to a relationship. Christianity is a relationship. Between us and our Heavenly Father. Right? It's not a series of do's and don'ts. It's not just, you know, I go to a place to punch my ticket to, you know, appease my conscience. That's, that's religion. Shit is actually a relationship. It's a thriving relationship. It's a growing relationship. Right? It's a vital relationship. Like there's, there's life in it. Can you say amen? amen? So when Jesus says to them, pray like this. Jesus was actually trying to help him understand, listen, this is a relationship. I just want to lay down for you a, some key ingredients of a relationship. In other words, when he said pray like this, he wasn't saying just keep repeating these words. No, you can if you want to. But if you, but if you want a real relationship, you don't keep going to your wife and say, keep saying the same exact things over and over again. Because you sound more like a robot than you are a person. What he was saying is, no, hey, I want to give you a template. For how you should communicate with this living being. Like, I want to give you some things that he actually cares about. Like, I want to give you, almost like he's saying, like, let me give you the heart of this God that you're praying to. Let me show you his heart for you. And, and his heart that he wants for every single person that approaches him. So he says, pray like this. He's saying, again, if you're taking notes, here's some key ingredients. Right? You're going to make a meal. Here's some key ingredients of a, of a, of a great meal called prayer. That you can walk away feeling full from having this meal. Can you say amen? amen. So, so he says, pray like this. And notice how the prayer starts. He says, pray like this. He said, this is how you should pray. Father. I love that. Right? Why? Because once again, what's he doing? He is once again making sure that we know it's a relationship. Right? He didn't say, ask for things. He said, Father. Right? In other words, acknowledge who you're talking to. First of all, you're talking to a dad. Right? A few weeks ago, we talked about how sometimes in order for us to have a thriving relationship with God, we have to know the difference between our earthly father and our heavenly father. Yeah. Right? Because a lot of times when we say father for some people, that's not that great. Because your, your earthly father wasn't that great. But we're talking about your heavenly father here. Yeah. Right? We're talking about the father of the universe that you're talking to, right? So the first thing we have to understand that this is not an impersonal being in the sky, right? This is a loving God who is best known as a father. In other words, he's saying father, someone who loves you and someone who is for you. So important to establish that because if you're going to go pray to someone, you, you better know that this person is for you. Because right? a lot of times people has, has had all the wrong ideas of God. Why? Because first of all, the earthly father and because of earthly religion. It says God is mad at you. God is angry at you. God doesn't, doesn't care about you. And some people say, you hear people say like, I don't have to pray about that because that's, why would God care about that? Well, because he is a loving God. Like he's a loving father. I'm a father of five. Some of the stuff my kids talk to me about makes absolutely no sense. But they're my children, and I care very much about my kids. So I pay attention to everything they have to say, not because of the substance of what they're saying, but because of the substance of the relationship that we have to each other. 
But, and what's interesting is, if you keep reading this chapter, Jesus goes on to give you an illustration about praise. He says, if, if earthly fathers who are evil know how to give good things to their kids, how much more does a heavenly father wants to bless you for pursuing him? That's so critical. We established that. That prayer is a loving connection between me and my heavenly father. It's not based on who I am. It's based on who he is. Like my kids don't come ask me stuff based on who they are. They know I'm dad. And they know how to pull the right strings of my heart. Right? My little girl's not to make the face. You know, the face that melts me every single time. My son, my one-year-old son who can't for the life of him sleep through the night. He's one year old, man. I would think by now. But when he wakes up 2, 3 in the morning and, and, and you're losing sleep, but when you see that cute little face, you know, and he starts making his, you know, his thing and he wants to play. It's 3 in the morning. Your heart melts. Because why? Because of your relationship with your kid. If we who are imperfect feel that way about our children, how much more does a perfect God, a loving God wants to hear from you? Right? So a father is many things. Right? A father, man, it's, it's a loaded word. Father means provider. Right? Father means healer, helper. Father means you're the authority. This is so important because a doctor says you have cancer. He's a medical authority. But I got to go to my heavenly authority and said, he said I have cancer, but you are my heavenly father. All right, so it's important that I, that I establish that the first thing is he said, pray this way, father. Right? You have a relationship with this father. He's a provider. He's a helper. He's a healer. He's the authority. He's also security. Sometimes things will open up under you. You didn't expect. Where do you go? The Bible says, it says you got to go to where your help comes from. Your help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so he is the refuge that we go to in times of trouble. Can you say amen? This is how you should pray. Jesus said, Father, may your name be kept holy, powerful. Say, understand, you are talking to your heavenly Father and he is holy. The word holy, if you're taking notes, is the word distinct. In other words, remember, you're talking to a father who has a distinct nature about himself. He's not human. He is holy. He's divine. Right? The word holy also means this, if you're taking notes, is the word unchanging. You have a God who is unchanging. Which, man, I'm so thankful that I'm praying to a God who is unchanging. You know, the world is changing. My friends are changing. Right? Situations change. Circumstances change. Society is changing. But thank God that he is faithful and he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I can always go to him because I'm going to a God who is father, but he's also unchanging. Amen. And he's faithful. And he's also dependable. We know so many things are not dependable anymore. Yeah. And to make matter worse, people are not dependable. But thank God there's a father who is dependable. Amen. And he's, and the other word here for, for, this is so powerful. The other word here for holy is the word integrity. He's a God full of integrity. Because we know people who never keep their words. Sometimes I don't keep my word. Hello, somebody. Don't look at me like I'm weird. Look at yourself for a second. So Jesus is saying he is father, but he's holy. In other words, the, the first main ingredient of prayer is worship. I'm coming to a God that has my reverence, has my focus, has my respect. Why do we start every service with worship music? It's to take the eyes off of us, to put it on him. 
The goal is that all week long, you know, I, I, I've, 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 met, I've had many different experiences, encounters and stuff. And it gets on me sometimes that I need to stop and start my week by putting my eyes on him and focus on him, on his authority, on his will, on his purpose, on who he is. Not who I am or how my week was. I need to focus on him. That's why that's the number one thing when it comes to prayer. I have to understand he is a loving father and he was worthy of all my worship. I can't worship my job. I can't worship my family. I can't worship my kids. I, all that stuff is fickle. It comes and goes. It's up and down. But God is never changing. He's always dependable. He's always focused. So I got to come to God as the object of my worship. Because worship is not just music. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship says this is where I turn to. In the Old Testament, prophets would never give a word of God without worship first. Sometimes the kings will say, what decision should we make? They're like, did you worship yet? Did you go to God first? Did you know that worship is a form of prayer? Yeah. Right? It's not just singing songs. You're making declarations. You're making affirmations sometimes. And you're, and you're prophesying sometimes as you worship. Worship takes your eyes off of you and puts it on God. Worship takes your eyes off your problems. I don't know if you notice sometimes, in worship, the things that you came in carrying begins to reduce in magnitude because you understand now I'm in the presence of something greater and bigger than my problem, my situation. I'm in the presence of God himself. And I've told you this many times, you, you, you can turn your car into a worship service. And just put on that music and sing your heart out. You're the worship leader of your soul. Yeah. Uh, you don't need Elijah coming around. <laughs> uh, you, you need you to enter the presence of God. Right. Um, by the way, we have an amazing worship leader. <laughs> Jesus goes on to say, may your kingdom come. This is such a powerful thing in prayer. May your kingdom come. If you're taking notes, it's interesting that the concept here of prayer is God works where he is invited to work. God works when he's invited in. And you're like, he's God. Why does he need that? Because, because this interesting, this God, he's so powerful, but he's so principled. He works by principles. He's not going to force his way in. Right? He, he works where he is invited to work. So when you say, may your kingdom come, it's almost like you're saying, God, I'm, I, want, I want you to come and work here. Yeah. Right? And, 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 and in other ways, this is like saying, God, Jesus is almost saying, like, when you're saying that, it's almost like a loaded question. Like, are you available for God to work? Are you at his disposition for him to work? The reason why a lot of times people don't see fruits in prayer is because they already have their mind made up. They never invited God to work. They came to God already with their mind made up. It's what most people do in counseling. They already come with their minds made up. And they want you to say something to them that agrees with what they already made up their mind about. But that's not counseling. Counseling is to come with an open heart and mind and say, listen, I'm thinking this way, but what do you think? Like, what, what do you think about this? Unfortunately, our society nowadays, no one listens. We just talk to reply. So sometimes God is saying, I'm waiting for you to make yourself available so that I may come. See, the, the, the point of Christianity, if you're taking notes, is we were meant to become now God's agent on this earth. Representing him, not representing ourselves. That's why a lot of people don't see the power of prayer because all they see is themselves. Notice Jesus didn't start with a laundry list of things. He started with relationship. Right? That's so critical because most of the times people look at prayer as a laundry list. Right? I need this, 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 and this. Right? And there's no connection there. There's no relationship there. And sometimes God may not give you something that he feels might be harmful for that relationship. That's good. So this is so powerful. This is, this is where, this, I hope you're tracking with me today. When you say May your kingdom come. You're saying like this is where we bridge the gap between heaven and earth. 
Now, this is a great mystery. I hope you can track with me tonight. But every time you're praying, in a sense, what you're doing is you're bridging the gap between two dimensions. You're bridging the gap between heaven and earth. Like, the way the Bible talks about heaven and earth is not the way that we think about heaven and earth. We usually think about heaven and earth as two separate places altogether. Like, like I die, I go to heaven. But the Bible doesn't talk about that. God says, you should bring heaven to earth. Like the two supposed to collide. The two supposed to like once in a while. I don't know if you ever had this experience in prayer or even church where you feel like, wait a minute, this transcends the norm. Like it doesn't feel normal. It doesn't feel like I'm just here. It feels like I'm here but I'm there at the same time. You ever had that experience where you feel like something else is happening here? Right? He says, may your kingdom come to earth. And may your will be done on earth as it is in Heaven is two dimensions. By the way, the way the Bible closes, the way the Bible ends, is that one day the heaven one will overlap the earth one. Okay, that's how the whole thing ends. Right? It, so this is going to mess you up. So, so if this is true, it's not about going somewhere. It's about bringing something here to this place. Right? It's about bringing something here to this place. So every time you pray, in a way, you're bringing that other dimension into reality. Every time you, 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 you lose the essence of just, you know, me, myself, and I, pay bills and die, when you really tap into who you are, an eternal being, you're bringing heaven to earth. So when you're praying, you're not just doing a religious mechanical thing. You're bringing two dimensions together. In other words, we bridge the gap between two realms. Your will be done on earth as is already done there. But the whole thing is, is that he's bringing the whole thing together. How do we know this? Think about it. If the whole point was to go somewhere, why don't he just save you and ship you up? He leaves you here to bring the dimension here to this place. That's why we have to experience God. Because when you do, you can actually bring him to your job. Like your job could be less purgatorish and a little bit more heavenly if you begin to tap into God. Maybe your relationships would be less of a living, you know, purgatory and more of a living heaven if we can start to understand, I can bring heaven to earth. What did Jesus do when he walked the earth? I hope you catch this. This is where it burns me up that we reduce this thing to a religion and a, and a, and a weakened thing. What Jesus was doing is everywhere he went when he was healing people, Blessing people, preaching. He was bringing heaven to each one of those situations. He was saying, this is what heaven looks like. There's no sickness in heaven. This is what heaven looks like. There's no blindness in heaven. This is what heaven looks like. There's no lack in heaven. What he was doing is he was bringing heaven to earth. Pockets of it here and there. Why do you think he has local churches in every city? He's trying to say, let's bring little pockets of heaven all over the place. Let's put heaven where you are. That's the goal. That's the goal of Christianity. Let's not reduce this thing to a religion. You can bring heaven to your situation. The two will collide. There's a tension there. Right? But God says, no, I want you to pray like, like it is in, in heaven. And what is the kingdom of heaven? It's talking about the kingdom of joy, peace, patience, kindness, provision, miracles, breakthroughs. That's the kingdom of heaven. Not when I die, you know, we'll go somewhere. It's like, what a, what a terrible way to, to exist until then. In the meantime, why don't I keep bringing pockets of that yeah, yeah, yeah. here? Amen. Can you say amen? amen? He goes on to say, give us each day the food we need. Like, how cool is that? He says, ask for what you need. Like, he's... He's basically emboldening you, saying, go ahead and ask. I know you have needs. Ask. God cares about your daily needs. Matter of fact, if you keep reading, he gives you, Jesus loves to give stories to illustrate this, his, his point. If you keep reading Luke 11, he talks about how sometimes you have to persist in what you need. Hey, he says, like, you got to be, like, almost like a nagging person. If you need something, like, you, can, you just not stop asking for it. And kids are a great illustration of that. My kids will not leave me alone. They get it. It's like if I keep nagging dad, he's going to break down. 
Like, they get it. They know, like, hey, I just got to keep pulling his leg. I just keep, keep pulling his leg. And, and that's, that's a picture of prayer sometimes, right? You just got to keep pulling on God's leg until he's like, ah, oh, you just, okay, I got I to gotta, I gotta do something here. Listen, you got to persist in prayer. Most people give up too easily. Sometimes I believe we're in a brink of breakthrough and then we give up. Right? Like the next prayer could be the day of breakthrough. Like the next time you pray about something you believe in, who knows? That might be the moment that breaks the heart of God and say, I need to do something here. It's biblical. There was a woman who told Jesus, hey, my daughter is sick and I need you to heal her. And Jesus tested her faith and said, ah, I got, I got things to do. I got a place to go. She goes, no, but I'll take anything. She's like, I'll take the crumbs off your table. Like, she understood. Like, no, I know who I'm talking to. Right? Like, like some people are too proud to beg. When it comes to God, man, don't be too proud to beg. Say, I'll take the crumbs off your table. Like, whatever you got to give me. And you know what Jesus said about this woman? Jesus stopped and said, whoa, I have not seen faith like this in all of Israel. Wow. And this was a Gentile woman. In other words, a woman that wasn't supposed to be religious, didn't know the Bible verses, didn't know anything from, from anything. But she's like, I know one thing. I'm talking to the king of kings and I need something here. You want to see Jesus be amazed? Jesus is amazed at your faith. And it comes from places you don't expect. The Roman centurion said, hey, you can say a word. And my daughter will be healed. And my, I mean, my servant will be healed. He's like, what? You believe I can just say a word? Say the word. And on that same moment he said the word, someone came back and said, your servant was healed. Listen, there's power in your prayers. All you got to do is not believe you. Believe him. Like, believe who he is. Ask. Here's the thing. If you don't ask, the burden is on you. You ever realize that? Right? If I don't do this, who else? Well, you are on. Yeah, last time I checked, it's not fun to be on. It's not fun being up 4 or 5 in the morning trying to figure out how I'm going to make this happen. As opposed to say, God, I'm going to give this to you because I need to sleep. <laughs> you know, the most spiritual thing I can do right now is sleep and let you worry. Let you figure it out. Let you work away when there seems to be no way. And I'm always amazed when you get up, usually there's an answer waiting for you. God is faithful. If you don't ask, it's on you. Tell your neighbor, man, why are you tight? Stop being tight. It's on him, not on you. He goes on. He says, forgive our sins. This is now a powerful thing because Jesus basically saying is the father, I hope you catch this, cannot take note of a prayer from a petitioner who is more interested in getting than in godliness. <laughs> Did you catch that? The father is more concerned with you becoming like him than just him giving you stuff. So he says, forgive us our sins. Why? The only thing that can separate you from the love of God is your sins. It's the only thing that keeps the harmony out of sync. He's a loving God. He'll come after the 99. He'll leave the 99 and come after you. But once he rescues you, he says, now go and sin no more. That's the part no one wants to preach anymore. Right, we say only God can judge. Yes, it's true. He doesn't want to though. So he says go and sin no more. The word sin is missing the mark, people. He's saying forgive me for the times that I missed the mark. This is a daily inventory. This is a daily thing. Because I'm not perfect like him, and so I miss the mark a lot. But here's the thing. I believe this. The more I seek him and the more I find his will and his heart and his forgiveness, the less and less I begin to miss the mark. Something happens to me where I begin to now align myself more and more with him. Not because I have to, because I want to. It's a relationship with him. So you don't have to tell me and try to mold me and try to push me. It's like it's a willing desire. I just want to be in tune with God. I want to live my life according to his will because my life actually is better when I'm trying to pursue him and his will, his desire for my life. That's the reality. Right? 
Sin hinders my walk with him. I can't see him straight. Right? Why does the sheep go astray? It's because he can't hear his voice. He can't hear it, so he'll, he'll, he'll keep going. But you know what, what a shepherd does when, it, when the sheep goes astray? He just begins to call to him. Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? You ever read it? That's so good. God wasn't lost. That's so good. He could see where Adam was. He was just trying to say, hey, I'm still over here. I know you're trying to hide. I know you're trying to figure out how I'm going to get this thing to work like I just messed up. But he's saying, I'm still calling out. Come on. I believe tonight you hold, the Holy Spirit is saying, where are you? Come on. He's not saying, like, where are you physically. He's saying, where are you in your heart and mind? Like, are we, are we here? Are we good? Like, because he said, though your sins may, may, may seem like it's keeping you at bay, he says, I'm here. Your sin doesn't keep me from you. That's why you got to just say, Lord, forgive me. Why? Here's what happens. Confession restores harmony. Isn't it true in our relationships? The most powerful thing you can do in a marriage is say, I'm sorry. That goes a long way. Right? When my kids say, Daddy, I'm sorry, that's it. That's it. That just takes away so much. Right? God is that way. Sometimes people are like, man, you, you read the Bible, God seems to be angry. I'm like, you're reading it wrong. Because you're not a parent. When you're a parent, you will understand God's heart. God doesn't want his kids to be doing reckless stuff. He wants to be the reckless one. Right? And so when you're doing reckless stuff, he's like, ah, knucklehead, what are you doing? Just come back. Like God is that father that is so heated that you broke curfew. But the moment he hears the key at the door, he's relieved. Because you're home. That's grace. And you open the door and he's ready to like go in on you. But then he sees you and he's like, oh, goo goo, ga ga. That's it. Like I just want us to be in harmony. Can you say amen? Confess and restores harmony back into the relationship. It's not do's and don'ts. It's a relationship. Right? We say sorry because we mean it. Because we know life is better with you than apart from you. Can you say amen? amen. Now, Jesus drives this deeper because he says, we also got to forgive those who sin against us. Now, this is very heavy because preacher Jack Hafer says this about this. He says, Jesus prohibits a vertical approach to God than neglects a horizontal approach to people. Now, I hope you catch this. He's saying, like, if you don't forgive others, you're, you're, it's not God blocking your prayers. It's you. Because every person is made in the same image of God that you are made in. And every person misses the mark like you missed the mark. Right? That's why Jesus says that you should never condemn others. It's not saying, like, there's not a time for accountability. What he's saying is when you, when you condemn others, you're condemning the image of God in them. And God doesn't do that to you. Why would you do that to somebody else? Right? So, so catch this, right? God, if you take your notes, forgiving others is God wants to raise people who look like him. Because he forgave you. Remember, you're the, you're the one sheep that went astray. God wants to raise a group of people who will bring heaven on earth like he does. Because that's what he does. Now catch this. Relationships in God's eyes takes precedent over worship. Now this is heavy. In other words, you can worship him all day long, but if you haven't restored a relationship, he doesn't care. Because he measures the way you worship him by the way you care about the relationships around you. You know what Jesus said? He said, if you know you're about to enter the temple to worship, but you know a brother has something against you, you should go first and restore that relationship. Then you can come back and worship me. Did you catch how he said it? He didn't say, he didn't say well, it's their problem. He said, no, if you know they have something against you, not you against them. That, my friends, takes a lot of maturity. Right? Jesus is saying, no, I don't want you to wait on them. I want you to take the initiative to restore things. Why? Because why? Because that's what he did. He didn't wait on us. He came. 
while we were still sinners, Christ died for our sins. So he's saying, like, I want to raise a group of people that look like me, that talk like me, that forgives like me, that blesses like I do. One time I was in a worship service as a youth pastor a long time ago. And I, you know, I was invited to, to go somewhere. And I saw this young lady deep in worship and she was in, you know, worshiping like we do. Um, and, and worship ended and, and the mom came up to her to say something to her and she just like snapped at her mom. And I'm like, there's a disconnect there between your worship and your relationship. Right? Because we can sing all day long, but if we're not restoring relationships, we're not bringing heaven to people's earth, then we miss the point of why you worship in the first place. If worship doesn't lead to tangible approach to people, then we miss the point of why we pray in the first place. Right? Now, catch this, right? This is actually for our own good. This is the part of prayer when you release people to God. If you don't release people to God, you will harbor anger right. and bitterness and things you're not supposed to carry. Right. And when you carry those things, you're not carrying heaven with you. You're carrying the other thing. Now, I know this is, this is not easy because it depends on what people have done. But... Our greatest example is Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's saying, I want you to have that same flow of grace in you as I have for you. Because it's one thing to embrace the grace for me. It's another thing for me now to give that grace freely unto others. Jesus illustrated this point again when he talked about a guy that owed a king thousands of dollars. And the king forgave him. And on the way home, he saw a guy that, that owed him 20 bucks, and he almost choked the guy out of life. And Jesus said, that's what we do. The Father forgives us for countless stuff, but we have a hard time forgiving that person for a little thing. He says, that, that's not the people of God. We're supposed to forgive like God forgives. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? You see, I'm not sure if you caught on yet, but this is what it means to experience God. Like, in praying and in forgiving people, you are experiencing God. That's the experience. I hope you caught this. The, the goal is not to pray to experience God. The goal is to pray because prayer is experiencing God. Like, I hope, you, you, I hope you're tracking here, right? The whole point is that as I'm praying, I'm experiencing God. I'm not waiting to experience God. I'm experiencing God as I'm praying. And then when I come out of prayer, there's always a direct command of what I need to do. Right. And don't let us yield to temptation. This is what we call progress. There's always room for growth. This is where I am as honest as possible with myself and with God to say, there are some things that I still am prone to. There are some things that, that behind the scenes still has a hold on me. And I don't want them to have a hold on me. I want you to have a hold on them. Right? And so this is where I am brutally honest and say, Lord, there are some past strongholds, habits, thought patterns from the past. And this is where I need to evict everything that encroaches my progress. Everything that hinders me from becoming fully the human that you created me to be. I don't have time to make excuses in your presence. I don't have time to justify my sins. I need to just be real, Lord. I just need to say, Lord, there are some things I need to surrender to you and some things I need to surrender every single day until it loses the power and the essence that he has in my life. This is where I submit and I surrender to the Lord. I submit and I surrender to the Lord because I know what makes me prone to wonder. You have to be honest with the Lord. You have to be real if you want freedom. Freedom never comes to those who are still masking things. You have to be real. You have to call it like it is. He already knows it. He wants you to own it. Because he knows when you own it, I can set you free. Right? And so 
this is a template that, that Jesus is saying. These are the things that you should bring to God on a day-to-day basis. Right? And you don't have to necessarily follow this, this thing line for line. But if you understand that he's father and you begin to worship him, then these other things will begin to fall into place. Will begin to align themselves. Now, the last part of this as I end, you guys can come up, is this. Now, there's a part of prayer that's so critical. If you're going to hear God, you have to learn to listen. Because yeah, right. Right? a lot of people miss it. They'll come, they'll say a lot of things. And they don't listen. Yeah. Right? Some of the best counseling sessions I have are those. People just come and they tell me everything. I never got to talk. But they're like, thank you, pastor, for listening. It's like, you're welcome. But maybe if we leave room for the Holy Spirit, right. we might be able to get some things done. Right. This is why every week I try to tell you, don't be in a rush to leave church. God might want to say something back. God might want to say something back. Yeah. God might want to line up your week. He might want to line up that appointment. He might want to give you an insight into an issue. But you got to listen to see what God is trying to say. He's a living God. He speaks. He speaks. Right? And so we need to have the heart that Samuel had. He said, speak, Lord, I'm listening. Speak, Lord, I'm listening. Now, this takes work. You know why it takes work? Because we are so agitated. We're busy bodies. I told you about, you know, the whole thing about being busy. It's not a good thing. Because Jesus, the Savior of the world, had time to pray. How did we start this, this chapter? He said, Jesus came out of prayer. Sometimes Jesus would pray all night. All night seeking God. He's the son of God seeking God all night. Maybe I need to learn to practice the presence of God. There's a great little book called The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. This man who was a monk a long time ago, fourth century monk, he said, God is everywhere. He said, I could be doing the dishes and practice the presence of God. I could invite God into this moment where I'm washing dishes. Sometimes washing dishes is the most spiritual thing you'll do all day. Just sit there and say, God, I'm right here. Speak to me. Wash over me as I wash over these dishes. Have your way with me. See, the, the, the goal of this experience God thing is that anyone can experience God. It's not some elite spiritual people that can experience God. Sometimes the elite spiritual people will miss God because they're too elite. It's for everybody who would be willing to say, God, speak to me. I'm listening. The more I listen, though, the more he calls me to do some things. And the more I obey, the more he unlocks revelations. Because God doesn't want to waste his revelation if you're not going to do anything with it. Right? So he gives you something. He trusts you with something. He's like, now act on that and I want to trust you with more. That's what prayer is. It grows. Anyone can hear from God. Right? So practically, I just leave you with this tonight. Listen. Have a time and a place to seek God. God is everywhere, but there's something powerful about you setting up a place. You say, this is where we meet. This is our special place. You know why? Because the power of repetition, as we talked about. When I go somewhere and I, and I designate that area, this is, you know, in the Old Testament, they used to call them the altars of God. They would set up an altar and say, this is where God is. This is where I meet with him. And, and, and I worship because when I worship, I'm taking the eyes off of me. I'm putting it on him. And then I begin to say what I need to say. Or sometimes I need to just listen. I, there's no really like formula. It's about just learning to just be in his presence. Sometimes prayer is literally just listening. It's meditating. It's taking a verse and saying, Lord, how does this verse apply to my life? Right? There's no really one, two, three step. It's just about, listen, I'm in the presence of my heavenly father. And he's for me. If I sit here long enough. He's going to download some things in my life. Would you stay with me? I want to pray for you tonight.